Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on where you are on the planet. Welcome to this energy talk organized by E.ON. We have a fantastic and fascinating and extremely important topic today with a, a very a, a excellent group of people to discuss. We'll cover topics which are probably among the most important topics on the planet. About the planet, climate change, about energy, about data, which is also often called the new oil, ironically, about technology and artificial intelligence, about other technologies, including blockchain, and how all those things relate to each other today and in the future, how they can relate to each other for a better future. To tackle all those issues, we have to, with us today three excellent panelists. Um, let me start with uh, introducing them. We have Vanessa Miller first, director, Energy, Innovation and Impact from Microsoft. Then we have Ed Hesse, co-founder and CEO of Grid Singularity. And we also have from E.ON, Juan Bernabe Moreno, Chief Data Officer and Global Head of Analytics at AI at E.ON. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you. And I'm looking forward, hopefully, like all our audience, for a great session and lots of fun covering important topics. Just a little bit of bookkeeping. We will start with uh, some opening statements from our three speakers. Then we'll exchange a couple of questions among ourselves to cover, to set up the stage in some sense. And then in about 35, 40 minutes maximum, we will uh, open the floor to Q&A from the audience. And then we'll close in about uh, 85 minutes, five minutes before the end for some closing statements and the wrap up. Looking forward to getting the questions from you and collectively discussing these important matters. So let me start with um, asking our three panelists to open up with some statements about how all those words, important words, energy, climate change, data, AI, relate and affect each other, both positively and potentially also negatively. Um, we can start from um, Ed, if, um, if, um, if you may. Thank you, Ed. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> um, thanks for having me. Um, um, yeah, um, you know, when I was first invited to this talk, controversy, uh, controversy around AI, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I asked Juan first, uh, what is actually the controversy? Because, um, you know, we, um, we work in blockchain and AI, and uh, we try to uh, we're building kind of a new market design, which is a, a next level fragmentation of the market design that enables um, anyone to participate in markets. And the only way that is possible um, actually is where, um, you know, there is AI trading on uh, consumers' behalf because consumers, you know, they won't be trading for such small values. And, um, you know, unlocking this value, we just see uh, benefits uh, because, you um, if anything can participate in markets, um, it just means it can get a, a return on investment, and uh, meaning there will be, you know, unlocking AI in, in, in the new market design will bring more and more advantages um, to bringing more renewables into the grid. So, you know, and then and then Juan actually told me the controversy uh, that it, um, you know, um, training AI and so forth uh, takes a lot of energy, and that immediately led me to the statement. <clears throat> or the, to uh, you know to the thinking that in the last few years we had a lot of um, um, uh, how to say um, there was a lot of kind of um, um, talk around how much energy Bitcoin is using in Ethereum proof of work mechanisms in those blockchains and um, and, and and for sure I mean that that's true you know uh, those blockchains uh, they use a lot of energy and um, but also here you know there is still um, a, a development going on it, it's kind of it, it, it was a first inefficiency that has been overcome uh, by energy web as a as a network which is utilizing a, a different uh, uh, consensus algorithm and there is other networks third generation blockchains uh, black, uh, blockchains which are now also going away from the proof of work mining to other very uh, low energy intensity consensus mechanisms. So that's kind of um, the angle I can contribute to this talk and I'm curious to hear the other positions. Thank you, Ed. And uh, it's interesting to, you already plug in in a discussion words, which is potentially surprising ex but as we will see very central, like markets, web, networks, 
of course ROI, right? New market design, I know it here, energy web, fascinating concepts. Uh, we'll talk about them later on. Vanessa, would you like to take a stab to the, to the opening statements? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, happy to, to join this panel on this uh, very core conversation for, for Microsoft. Uh, obviously, we are at the nexus of AI, data, uh, climate change. Um, and for us, for Microsoft, it's very clear that the next decade has to be the decade where we're tackling climate change and where companies like Microsoft are uh, at the forefront of contributing to climate change mitigation. So the first thing is, yeah, what is the what what is uh, the footprint uh, and what can we do to uh, reduce that footprint? And Microsoft has taken some pretty bold steps last year, precisely a year ago, where we made the commitment that Microsoft will be carbon negative by 2030. And so what does that mean? That means that we will remove more carbon out of the atmosphere that we emit every on a yearly basis. Um, and so I want to tackle like some some of the controversy that Ed mentioned, like what what is the energy intensity of AI and uh, and, and of data centers? And really, if we look about at, at the last 10 year journey, data, data centers, centers have been squeezing more work out of every electron year after year. The question is how much more can we do in the next decade uh, for us to meet our, our carbon negative goal and what will be necessary, uh, as Ed pointed out, from markets, uh, not just kind of from what we can do within our four walls, what we can do by improving energy efficiency. Like we, We're optimistic about technology and the promises of technology and AI, but it does seem that at the end of the day, data centers will still consume energy and we won't be, won't be getting to a, a, a zero energy data center. Uh, but for the last decade, we've seen that um, the amount of computing done in data centers has increased by more than 550% between 2010 and 2018. And the amount of energy consumed by data centers only grew by 6% during the same time period. So the energy efficiency gains that have been made in the data center space really kind of outpace anything seen in any um, major sector of the economy. And as a result, even though we talk more and more about the carbon footprint of data centers, and rightfully so, um, they, the data centers kind of still account for about 1% of global electricity consumption. So that's kind of about half what the airline industry represented maybe before uh, 2020, before COVID. And so this is really kind of what we want to continue delivering, kind of continuing to improve the energy efficiency of data centers. But then I said it doesn't stop uh, at what we do within our four walls. And so when we came out with this strategy of being carbon negative, uh, we put a few principles to kind of guide our journey. And one is definitely put data and digital technology to work. Um, simply stated, we can't solve a problem that we don't fully understand. And so we feel there is uh, an opportunity to leverage data to really deliver real-time carbon footprint, kind of the carbon truth uh, of, of, of our actions, not just Microsoft action really, but everybody's action. Um, the second one was, was really the one I already talked about is, okay, let's, Let's, let's take, take responsibility for our carbon footprint and let's do the best we can do within our four walls to reduce our carbon footprint. And the third one is really Microsoft carbon footprint is, is, is important and we should tackle it. But when we look at our numbers, um, so we reported 16 million metric ton of CO2 last year for scope one, two, and three. So that means our direct emissions, the emissions from the electricity we consume, and the emissions from a value chain, uh, supply chain, and, and use of sole product. Like when we compare that to Exxon, who just reported for the first time their uh, scope one, two, and three, and reported over 700 million metric ton, uh, we have a lot to offer and to figure out where data and AI can do to help decarbonize the world and others like Exxon. Um, so that's really where it's it's exciting, and I hope we get to talk a little bit more about like what we do with others, with customers, and with the energy sector at large. Thanks, Theo. Thanks, Vanessa. Excellent stuff. And yes, we'll get to this, how you guys do this and how the world is doing this. I must say that um, uh, it's kind of um, 
uh, strange for many people maybe today, definitely it has been for me re until recently that, you know, we talk about digital and, and pollution somehow, which makes no sense, right? I mean, when I'm thinking about pollution, I mean, I'm thinking about, you know, people, about commons with, uh, with smoke coming out from, you know, from, from the factories, coal mines, energy companies. I'm not thinking about, you know, computers and digital, but, you know, as you said, electricity consumption. But then we have the rest of the economy, the non-digital economy, if you like, which is transforming itself and is playing itself a role into this um, energy transformation and um, all these important issues we're discussing. So, Juan, you, um, you mm -hmm. represent the energy sector and um, one of the most tra a traditional sector, if you like, in many ways, although it's transforming itself. Can you just walk us through a little bit about what's the role of big energy companies in this discussion in high level for now? Thank you. Um, thank you, Teos. Uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, great panel, great panelists uh, enjoying that already. Um, let me put it this way. Uh, climate change is something that we need to solve. We need to solve now. And uh, there's no second chance for that. Um, one of the factors that uh, we need to address within the climate chain is like uh, the energy transition. We need to push for that. And uh, there's no way around of using our data, as Vanessa said, to understand better where we have the levers, but also to address uh, traditional problems like how can we just infit renewables into our kind of uh, uh, quite old uh, grid infrastructure? How can we make it work? Another aspect is like, uh, as we know, uh, the energy transition means that uh, we're going to be moving from central to decentralized energy setups, which means that everybody can participate into the energy world, becoming a prosumer. Uh, but it's all, it only works if we have the right uh, technology in place so that uh, whatever energy amount that we can create locally or store locally can be used uh, um, globally or kind of in a bigger scale by everybody. It only works without human intervention. It only works if we have the proper technology in place. And for me and for my team at Tion, um, that's what we do every day. So we come to work and uh, we help uh, addressing the energy transition or accelerating energy transition with our algorithms. The controversy, um, and I'm with Vanessa and with Ed in that, uh, comes because uh, AI, of, of course, uh, um, needs data. And uh, in order to make it work properly, it needs an immense amount of data. And this uh, data is not uh, for free, it needs to be stored, even if the efficiency in the data centers is uh, increasing magically. Um, we have some kind of uh, pay to, uh, price to pay there. And uh, the latest advances in uh, AI, they are pointing out to something called uh, red AI, in contraposition to green AI. And red AI is basically just uh, buying new results or better results by just uh, using bigger uh, infrastructure and more computing power. So there's a controversy in the academia as well, discussing uh, the role of uh, clean or green AI versus just uh, throwing uh, parameters or data into the mix and uh, you know um, getting an insane amount of energy being consumed. And the last part that's important here is like uh, the origin of the energy. So if we manage at least to, break, to trace the energy origin uh, so that we can demonstrate that all the, the, the energy consumed by, by algorithms or by AI or by computing uh, in a data center is coming from a green source, then of course it's a different story than just uh, putting more carbon into the mix. So that's something that uh, needs to be addressed as well. So that would be my, my opening words. Thanks, Juan. And indeed, uh, I must say that the energy sector is one of the most fascinating sectors for data people to work at. Because as you said, there is an important purpose, save the planet. It's a big purpose. Mm -hmm. um, I must say just um, for the audience also a little bit, I've been working in um, machine learning and AI for about 25 years, uh, 20 years at INSEAD, and before that I was for 10 years in MIT. And in the 90s, I was working at the time in machine learning and computer vision. We were running um, uh, machine learning algorithms which had uh, to estimate, I don't know, maybe 100, maybe 1,000 parameters, maybe a couple of thousand parameters using a couple of thousand images, maybe 10,000 images. It was very slow. I would just press a, press a button, go to sleep, come back the next day and see what happens. With a couple of thousand images and a couple of thousand parameters of a, let's say, sophisticated nonlinear regression, whatever it is. Today, we need millions of images. We use 
we use not need, we use millions of images, and we estimate billions of parameters, like coefficients, numbers, in the statistics. That's what that's what we're talking about. If one does like a, a similar to a Moore's law analysis regarding the data usage and the computation and the improvement in performance for machine learning algorithms over the past 25 years, one finds that actually the improvements, speed, accuracy, data hungriness, data consumption has been a Moore's law to the power of two, doubling much faster than Moore's law has been doubling for the past, has been, uh, has been in computation, has been increasing the past 50 years. It's amazing how fast it goes, because it's about data and computation and algorithms. So a lot of innovation, a lot happening is very fast, and it's kind of amazing. I would have never, for, uh, in, uh, I would have never guessed 25 years ago that 25 years later we'll talk about pollution from machine learning. It's like, oh, I never guessed this, never, ever, ever before. So it's amazing. Now, let me go back to you, Vanessa, and um, ask you if you don't mind to dig a bit deeper into the how. So you mentioned about all the initiatives you have at Microsoft and how yours, both internally, inside your walls and externally to help customers. So if you give us a little bit of more color and um, examples and um, you know, information and lessons learned and data and facts about how you do this, and also how do you help, both internally and externally, how you can help the clients do this. That would be very useful. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Deus. Uh, well, I'll, I'll jump back to some of the uh, comments that Juan made uh, about tracing the energy. Uh, if we if we look at, you know, the the carbon footprint of data center and AI computation, for the most part, it's electricity, and there's not a thousand pathway to decarbonizing electricity. It's energy efficiency demand response and behavior change, and at the end of the day, shifting to clean energy. And I think most uh, public data centers have made a commitment to power first to reduce, um, to improve the energy efficiency and, and reduce um, metrics like PUE uh, or look at other metrics that would kind of uh, monitor and, and, and really kind of track the improvement of the energy efficiency of the data center building design. Uh, but in addition, we all have uh, joined the RE100 initiative and I've all pledged to power data centers with 100% renewable energy. This comes in different flavors. Back, back to kind of, of what Juan said about how do you trace the energy and how do you trace the electron? And that's an interesting one because there's, um, there, there's no such thing as tracing the electron uh, directly, at least from a, an electricity uh, standpoint. And, um, but we are all thriving to kind of a better uh, truth and carbon truth. So we typically first um, have been carbon neutral. We've been, Microsoft has been carbon neutral since 2012. That means we've been procuring renewable energy credits, unbundled kind of commodity uh, certificates in, in every market where we have operations to, um, to, to claim 100% renewable energy. But as we looked around, we kind of saw that we could do more to first further the markets and further kind of the, um, the, the growth of renewable energy. And so we progressively shifted to what's called direct power purchases agreement and corporate kind of generally speaking kind of renewable energy corporate procurement. And we're now well in way to kind of be 100 percent renewable energy by 2025 with 100 percent direct renewable energy PPAs in every market where we have operations. But then the next phase is, okay, what's, what's next? What, do we, what can we do to accelerate that energy transition that Juan was talking about, which is really what, yeah, what also um, is, is what we're thriving for? Like, what is our role to further that? Um, and it's, it's really getting back to kind of the role of data, of that carbon truth, and that uh, there's so much we can do to improve the monitoring and tracking, tracking of, of energy, energy consumed, consumed in real time. And that's what we're working towards. So we just announced uh, last year, or almost a year and a half ago, um, a pilot with Vattenfall in Sweden to uh, power data center 24 seven with renewable energy. So 24 hours, seven days a week with renewable energy. Uh, that, that really creates kind of an hourly matching of renewable energy to make sure that we never rely on fossil fuel. But it's not just about kind of, okay, how can Microsoft do it? It's really how can we bring the grid so that they are relying on 100% renewable energy 
on an hourly basis? How do we get to grids that are powered with 100% renewable energy? And obviously, this is where I think Juan will have a lot to chime in, but the, the flexibility, the demand response, uh, the, the distributed generation of the gr nature of the grid uh, is going to be critical to deliver that promise that both the EU and now the, the Biden administration uh, have made that, you know, within the next 15 to 20 years, all of our grids will be 100 percent powered with renewable energy. That's pretty ambitious. And we think there is tremendous role that AI and machine learning can can help deliver here. I'll stop here. So much more I can say. But. Thanks, Vanessa. You you mentioned a number of uh, important concepts that will come back again. Um, uh, for example, you mentioned flexibility, which is very important. And we'll come to this again when we talk a little bit about you know the orchestration of a network of prosumers. All of us who can also you know produce and sell, not produce but sell energy potentially in the future. Maybe one of them will come back to this one when I come to you in a couple of minutes. Uh, but you also mentioned something else which uh, sounds fascinating and sounds like science fiction somehow to me, but I'm sure to also the audience about tracing the electron. That's what I'd like to go to Ed about and uh, to discuss a bit about how we can do this using uh, the blockchain and other technologies. Uh, but before going to Ed, just a brief reminder to the whole to the audience: please feel free to post questions. We'll be answering your questions. Well, some of them, not all of them, it's not possible, of course. In a few minutes after we finish uh, our our discussion, so please feel free to to post questions. So. Ed, and I'll come to Juan about what you're doing exactly at Eon and what can we learn from what you are doing at Eon, all other companies and the rest of the world. But uh, meanwhile, Ed, so what, what can you explain us? What does it mean trace the electron and what, what's the power of it and how? And give us examples, maybe. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> um, we have been um, founding the Energy Web Foundation four years ago was exactly this goal. How can we create um, um, a, a smallest common denominator in the energy market where all agree upon a specific state um, of transactions? And um, and the goal of that was actually create kind of a substrate to create kind of um, an environment uh, that is trustless, which anyone can use to actually trace electricity. And um, so the Energy Web Foundation is a is a, is a nonprofit foundation, and um, and um, it's it's one of the largest uh, consortia out there um, in the energy sector around blockchain, um, with roughly 160 members um, all around the globe. And um, it, the Energy Web Foundation works very similar um, uh, to to the Linux Foundation. So uh, they build open source uh, frameworks, and one of the first frameworks they built, um, kind of, a, it's, it's, it's a toolkit um, that is running on the energy web chain, is actually to trace to trace electricity. It's called the energy web origin. And um, a lot of um, the affiliates from the Energy Web Foundation ha have taken this um, um, open source uh, framework and built actually markets um, on top of the Energy Web chain to trace electricity. And um, and now we basically have um, um, a layer where, you know, it, it's not necessary to trust a specific entity, um, 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 but, you know, we, we all have kind of, you know, one single source of truth. And... Um, and, and 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 that was just the beginning um, of the energy web, uh, kind of the work of the energy web foundation. So, one of the and, first and use cases. So that's a quick clarification question for our audience, because I know I understand the audience is very diverse. So, can you give us a yeah. bit of walk us through the life of an electron, roughly speaking? Yeah. What does it mean to trace? Yeah. Why? How and why? Yeah. And how do we use this tracing? Just as an example, or maybe. And, you know, energy market. Um, the, 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 you know. All you need to measure, where does it go in and where does it go out? And um, so it means everything needs to be kind of um, authenticated. Um, um, you know, how much does this power plant produce? Uh, how, how much does uh, somebody consume at the same time or store and feed in again? And so once we start measuring all of that and putting all these measurements into a layer um, in, in, into you know, authenticate the data so that it um, uh, can be shared, then we can actually start tracing electricity. And that's exactly the framework of origin. So um, um, that's that's the simple mechanics of it. And um, one of the uh, one of the interesting um, kind of use cases that we saw in the last year was um, 
there is um, more and more blockchains um, on the market um, that wanted to prove that uh, the source of the electricity for their um, for their blockchain is green. And so the Energy Web Foundation also created a tool called Energy Web Zero um, in cooperation uh, with, with some chains like Ripple and Corda, which are also consortium chains. Um, and uh, they're utilizing this tool and they're tracing electricity, uh, which they use for maintaining their chain on the Energy Web chain. And thereby they can prove um, that all the electricity that they use um, to create their kind of um, uh, network is green. And um, now the biggest difference, uh, I mean, you know, the, the, the question is uh, certificates of origins already existed before. Now the difference with, uh, with Energy Web is um, um, uh, with the origin toolkit um, is um, that, uh, sorry, <laughs> some kids here. Um, is that the new framework enables a much bigger fragmentation, a much smaller granularity of accounting that. And, um, and that uh, only this capability, I think, um, can also enable many more use cases that, uh, you know, like, like Vanessa said, um, uh, Vanessa touched uh, upon this use cases is, for example, um, um, one could actually um, prove that if there is a specific token created, let's say let's say Bitcoin network, Bitcoin uses a lot a lot of energy, and uh, there is a miner uh, which has a lot of uh, you know. Just to have um, a sense, Ed, sorry, just to give some 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 context to the audience. Um, yeah. Yes. You, you, how much energy does it consume? Just roughly, you know, highlight numbers somehow for us to have a sense. Well, I mean, uh, Bitcoin, I, I can't really say, but it's always at some country level. I don't know if it's Denmark or Austria, or um, I, I, I can't say that anymore. But it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's at immense levels. And um, now, um, you know, the, the 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 use case that I wanted to describe is basically that um, one could actually um, uh, color a Bitcoin that was created in a specific data center with, uh, with you know, uh, as green or not green, you know, because we could we can trace where the electricity came from. Was it from a renewable power plant? And then we could actually say that this Bitcoin is green or not. And uh, now this is all possible. And um, and it's actually happening um, already in Ripple and Corda. So um, that's only the beginning. Um, I think what Vanessa and Microsoft kind of um, a, a big opportunity they have in the future is actually their data centers could actually be used as a, cert a certificate of origin banks because um, their data centers are all around the globe and you know they can shift capacity uh, all around the globe and um, so I think there is uh, there is much more potential that we have we, we can utilize in, in, in this kind of in these markets. Thanks, thanks, Ed. Lots of um, amazing stuff happening and will be happening. Uh, Juan, you, you've been looking into all, all this from all angles, including on how E.ON is using data and AI to yeah. improve energy efficiency, both for yourselves and for the, your clients, of course. Mm -hmm. um, uh, can, can you give us some examples and can you help us also? What can we learn from your lessons also as how you mm -hmm. do this, but also how you help your clients do this and how the future may look like in your vision? Yeah, um, I think that there's no way around um, using our data, as I said before. Um, when we talk about renewables, uh, the problem is like uh, we cannot uh, count on a particular generation amount. They're volatile, uh, but uh, we need to integrate them. So we need to kind of forecast how much we are going to be getting, but also we need to optimize so that we can distribute that uh, and prevent our networks to being congested. So uh, that's the very first step if we think about that. But even before, if we think of a wind park, um, a wind park can be massively optimized. We've done that before uh, with reinforcement learning so that uh, we get rid of the wake effect from one wind turbine to another one. Optimizing the layout, uh, optimizing, I don't know, something that's very, we're gonna be seeing in the next uh, years. Um, when we talk about uh, one of the issues of the energy is like, it's very difficult to store energy, so the battery management. When we all drive uh, electro vehicles, right, we're going to have a lot of uh, uh, transient batteries and um, probably at, at home um, overnight, you're going to have our cars uh, parked there and uh, you have a battery there that you can use, you can integrate. Now integrating that and making that play within the bigger system is only uh, for algorithms to be opti so to optimize 
there's no way of doing that manually uh, in an efficient way. And those are just examples of use cases. But uh, just to add some, so some use cases where people don't think that we are doing that. One of the issues that we have, uh, one of the reasons why we cannot push enough the, the energy transition is because of, uh, uh, sadly, the lack of uh, awareness and the lack of commitment. Um, when we talk about selling energy, people don't really care. They care about having uh, kind of uh, the, the supply secure at home. Uh, but there's a reason for that. It's very difficult for people to engage with electricity, right? It's very difficult for people to even to understand what the kilowatt hour is. Now, um, we can use data, we can use algorithms to create models so we can make um, this, um, you know, um, energy uh, more tangible for people so they can engage. One of the examples that we are doing using smart meter data is just to translate to translate consumption into units that people can relate and can interact with and can even offset. For example, um, your consumption translated in how many kilometers you would be able to kind of drive in an electric vehicle or how many, you know, what's your amount of emissions? But that's a difficult to touch again. Or how many trees could you just plant or uh, offset using this uh, energy? So we are also working on bringing energy closer to our customers, to the to our households, not only B two B, B two C customers, so that the engagement is there and uh, we all can drive the energy transition to this. Um, That's energy. one. Uh, indeed, there is an old saying, decades or decades old, from the sixties or something, that the biggest challenge in technology adoption and innovation is change of human behavior. Mm. Right? It's not about the knowledge about humans. That's, we know this it happens in the, inside the organizations when you all create um, you know, change of your organization, innovation and all that. But it's also the same problem in society and what you are discussing is absolutely spot on. Um, we have a lot of questions coming in from the audience. Uh, before we move to that one, I have only one last question to all of you to just share your thoughts. So clearly we're talking about problems which, as Vanessa said, they are not sitting only inside the walls of a company. They can be sitting outside the walls of a company you all talk about networks, about your customers, about you know uh, the, the, the consumers, the people, the education, everything. So it's a system that we have to optimize somehow. I like the word optimization, Juan, you mentioned many times. At the end of the day, we are far from optimized on this planet. And that will become evident to all of us that we are really unoptimized, it, definitely in terms of uh, consuming and producing and sharing and distributing energy. So we have way to go. We are still like in industrial revolution kind of times, in, in some ways one can say probably closer there than today in that sense. But now all these kind of changes require collaborations. Collaborations between different organizations, collaborations between different countries, regulators, companies, different industries. Anything to share on your mind and maybe also wishes about poten potential collaborations that will be needed or good examples of collaborations that are already happening. Uh, we can start from Vanessa if you like, um, given you started talking about out inside and outside the wall. What's your take on what kind of collaborations we need going forward to tackle all those problems? Uh, that's a great question, and that's that's a one that's kind of dear to me as I have a kind of a, a, a career that I bridge over public and private sector. Um, and yeah, I think this is you know we've seen over the last four years, I think, where in the side of the pond where I sit, uh, that companies have kind of filled a gap that was left by policymakers, um, but there's hope that maybe uh, there'll be kind of a different dynamic in the coming years. And so I think there is, there's definitely the, the first kind of type of collaboration is that public-private um, collaboration. We need policy to be able even to, we need policy change to be able to deliver our carbon negative goal. Uh, we need kind of technology breakthrough that will need serious kind of R&D investment. And that's also why we have decided to invest ourselves in these technology uh, breakthrough with our uh, climate innovation fund that we announced last year, which is $1 billion, but to be deployed like in four years. But if you think about the trillions that need to be invested in climate change, we know that we cannot deliver what we need to deliver in the next decade uh, on our own. Um, so there's also this private, um, uh, private, private equity R&D component that's very critical. 
one example, I, I mean, two examples maybe that I can share of how we're thinking about collaboration. So we've, there's so much that we don't know. And uh, even though it's not necessarily a, a good reference, I like to talk about the unknown unknowns or the known unknowns, but we have, we have definitely a lot of both particularly when you look about scope three emissions, the emissions from our supply chain. And so we'll need much more kind of collaborations between um, mm -hmm. customers and suppliers. Um, we'll need to create the tools together. And I think all companies that have scope three goals, and there's more and more companies that are setting scope three goals to be in line with the 1.5 uh, degree pathway scenario or, or with uh, uh, the science-based target initiative. Um, we'll need to share our best practices. And so we announced in July last year, the Transform to Net Zero Coalition, uh, where with eight other companies, including Merce, Nike, Unilever, uh, Natura, we've, we, we're kind of gonna exactly do that, kind of share uh, our best practices of how we're tackling our scope one, two, and particularly scope three uh, carbon emissions. What does it mean to be net zero versus carbon neutral versus carbon negative? Like, you know, we're all talking about things that are voluntary. Companies have all set targets that are voluntary, unless you're maybe facing kind of the EU ETS in Europe. But for Microsoft, it's all voluntary targets. It may change as policy change. Uh, but because it's voluntary, that means there's many standards and, uh, and we just need to be kind of more transparent about what actually we're trying to do. And then another example of kind of collaboration that I, I think is pretty exciting uh, we talked a lot about, you know, getting access to more data, leveraging the data, and really trying to understand better the problem. Um, we know so little about the earth, and I'm getting a bit outside of the energy sector here, but we know so little about um, the biodiversity. Like, there's so many species we have in maps. We, we, don't, we don't know, you know, how many animals there are. And so we've created last year, we've announced last year this planetary computer effort which is really very similar to the digital uh, twin uh, Earth that the EU has announced and, and a few efforts that NASA is putting together. And that's kind of very exciting because it's putting the research, the academics, um, the companies that are dealing with large amounts of data, um, the, the, the companies that are trying to address, like, for example, poaching um, uh, of endangered species or, or, or planting or agricultural business like all together to really leverage the full potential of AI. And, um, and, and the idea here is, you know, the planetary computer will, won't solve it all. It will be the planetary computer plus the European Spatial uh, Agency plus NASA plus all these efforts that will really help us um, to, to have a better picture of what is going on with Earth and how do we monitor and tackle climate change uh, over the next decade and, and then up. The next 10 years because it's hard to think about 2050. Uh, so I think there's lots great. of potential for cooperation. Yeah, great. This, this is amazing. I mean, I'm getting goosebumps when I'm hearing about the planetary computer because at least when I was growing up, I barely had a computer, right? It was like working with a kilo. Kilo, kilo was K. I would see K in front of everything, you know? And now it's like, you know, planetary computer. Amazing. And we're only at the beginning. Let me just remind the audience. I always like reminding the audience the following. It's been about 150 years, maybe less, that we started not using, at least in some parts of the world, uh, methods like uh, bloodletting and removing the, basically removing the blood of people to treat them when they are sick, right? <laughs> it's been like for thousands of years until like we started doing scientific approach to clinical try and clinical trials and scientific approach to thinking and you know deciding that we were killing people by removing their blood when we want to treat them. So we are still at the very beginning of the history of planet Earth. And it's about time, finally, for computers to come in the picture. So I, I really love this planetary computer, or planet, the, 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 the concept over here, and fascinating stuff. Uh, Ed and Juan, maybe, and then we go to the audience briefly so we can have time for the audience questions on the collaborations, sorry. Yeah, maybe from my side, I mean, the uh, yeah, the... the... <laughs> The planetary computer, I really like the idea because, I mean, that that was, you know, um, uh, that was the idea behind blockchain, you know, where you have one computer that, you know, that, that can't be stopped, uh, where, which we can use to outsource um, kind of frameworks um, or rule sets, uh, you know, that all agree upon. So, 
you know, everything that we do at Energy Web Foundation or Grid Singularity is not possible without collaboration because um, without consensus, uh, there is no joint state or there is no joint kind of action that we all agree upon. And so, and that is that is also very much kind of the culture change that we try to push. Um, I've been working in energy markets in the last 20 years and, um, you know, compared to the um, pure IT sector, uh, sector, it's it, it's not very open, you know, and so the the you know, there is hardly any open source tools. Um, there is uh, not so much collaboration around um, sharing tools and um, and so forth. And so I think in the last four years, we um, I'm very proud of that, that with the Energy Web Foundation Grid Singularity, we at least have contributed a little uh, to this, uh, to this uh, culture change. Um, and a lot of the utilities that joined us um, have also, we have seen change actually in the utilities as well and the uh, TSOs and all the different uh, affiliates that they are more and more open um, to this uh, to this cultural change um, of uh, collaboration and open source. And um, mm -hmm. I think that is the only way how we can accelerate, um, you know, what, what we're building to, to, to enable, a, a, you know, a carbon free energy system. So, yeah, I'm curious about the questions. Um, yeah. So just before we go there, Juan, you want to add something or you maybe briefly before we go to the questions? I mean, just just to, to, um, just to, uh, to mention that um, I think what uh, we are changing our mindset, right? Uh, we know that the problem is bigger than any single company, academia or government. And we know that we cannot just get it done alone. Uh, I would like to point out to a kind of cooperation that I really like because I see it more and more, yet uh, we have a lot uh, to do there, which is like bridging uh, industry and academia. Um, the, the, the way of engaging our universities into solving this problem with companies, that's something that we need to push it more. I think uh, we are on the right way, but uh, there's so much to do because the, the disconnect is really damaging us. Uh, we could, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's a pity it's how, mu how much potential is just not being used because of uh, this two parallel world. Uh, that's one collaboration type that we'd like to kind of intensify. And the other one is like, as I said before, the change in mindset. Uh, let me just uh, bring up the collaboration that we are, for example, as Eon uh, running with Microsoft. Apart from being customers, which is a kind of um, a great because they are a great company, Vanessa, but uh, we are co-developing products just to improve, uh, to do something as, as silly as scanning all the geographies to a spot and quantify potential to install solar panels. Something as uh, kind of as easy to explain as that with so much potential. And that's something that we are uh, doing kind of in a joint approach. So we are moving away from just uh, kind of customers uh, from, we are co-developing something because we believe it's something bigger. And that's the kind of uh, collaboration that we are going to be seeing a lot. and. Uh, I'm so happy that it's happening already. Thanks, Juan. And uh, well, as you yes. know, uh, yes, maybe I'm I could add a little point to this. Okay. Yeah. So the um, you know my prediction for the uh, what 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 we believe will happen in the energy market is very similar that what we have seen actually in the um, in the blockchain space, specifically Ethereum. So. You know, in the first few years, uh, we saw a lot of uh, startups building open sourced uh, frameworks um, for tokenization. Um, um, and so they basically were building standards. And um, and that's what's happening in the energy sector as well, um, in, in, in the Energy Web Foundation. All the first uh, frameworks that are being built are standards. Um, well, of course, they're only standards that they're being picked up of the market. But we all see, uh, already see a lot of um, a lot of the market players picking up those standards and building their own solutions on top of this. And once you're in the blockchain space and um, and you utilize one of those standards, you build um, a decentralized application on top of it. The interesting aspect here is that somebody else doesn't have to reinvent it and just can connect to it. So the the effect that we have seen in Ethereum is something that um, is called decentralized finance. So, and 
and decentralized finance took off immensely in the last uh, one and a half years. So we we predict exactly a similar behavior in the energy space and the energy web foundation uh, energy web chain where. Um, once the standards have been defined and picked up by um, players around the globe, um, um, then uh, we expect a Cambrian explosion in the next few years around um, uh, kind of um, like decentralized energy, decentralized finance applications um, that goes into lending, that goes into tracing, uh, into any type of um, um, use case you can imagine. So I think we're at the brink uh, of something in the next, in, in this year and next year where um, I, I, I'd, I'd like to, you know, in two years' time, uh, you know, look back again, look at that time we were expecting this and then see, ah, here we are finally, um, you know, um, in this, an environment where uh, there is open innovation happening at, a, at an exponential space um, and enabling 100% um, uh, renewables in the market. So I think there is something really big to come in the next two years. Thanks, Ed. And exactly. I mean, you, you mentioned decentralization. We talked about orchestration, about all of us, you know, as I mentioned earlier, all myself, also the prosumer side. It all reminds me a little bit, and that's one of the first things um, I actually mentioned. That was my first reaction when we first talked with Juan and some people from E.ON. Uh, at the time, I was not very familiar with the energy sector and, and how the AI can, and they can help. And that, as I was hearing uh, Juan and the E.ON people talking about this, my reaction was like, oh, my God, this looks like online media and online advertisement networks. When I was growing up, and all of us were growing up, I'm sure, most of us, we used to have one TV channel, maybe three. At least in Greece, we had like three. Actually, we had two, and some people had three. It's like, oh, wow, that's big, 50, 30% increase. Basically, Sandra, like big energy company giving you like energy, basically. We had one energy company in Greece back then, like most countries, I'm sure. And now we have like everybody's potential advertiser, everybody's potential uh, um, um, uh, advertising space and the producer of, of, um, of advertisements, in a sense. You can advertise on your personal Facebook. Same happening seems to be here. Everybody can sell their energy in the cars, but in their car battery or in their building or whatever. That's where we're going. And for this, as you are saying, that you need like standards to orchestrate this network and data and AI and information to manage this market, this energy internet that is coming up, consisting of all of us being players, not as consumers only, much like we were in the TV 30 years ago, but also as producers and spaces for producing and storing, uh, so for storing energy. I'm going to go quickly to the audience questions. And um, I'm getting, first of all, I have to excuse myself because I'm not aware with, I'm not familiar with all the technologies you guys are talking about. So I'm not, maybe I don't understand some questions, but one question here, which maybe relates to what you were taking, taking uh, talking about Ed. So I'll come to you first, unless somebody else wants to chip in. It's coming from Andreas, Andreas Nestel, and he's asking, what about potential applications of distributed ledger technology, DLT, and direct acyclic graphs, DAG. I mean, I guess maybe you answered this already, but maybe you wanna, if, if somebody wants to add in, as you wish, add something to add. Yeah, this is a, yeah, this is a, um, this is a, a question around consensus, um, how to reach consensus in a network. Um, so um, there is a lot of competing, uh, there is a lot of innovation happening right now, how to achieve consensus in a, net, uh, in a network in a faster way and actually at the same time enable uh, scaling of the chain. So um, the kind of the first generation of chains, there were, you know, uh, 10 minutes block time in Bitcoin, then we had Ethereum, um, and um, and now we're going kind of in the third generation with Polkadot and Kusama and so forth. And, um, and the, the biggest problem is always scalability. And so there have been a couple of teams that have been utilizing uh, DIGs um, as, as, as asked on this question for optimizing that. but it's still kind of, you know, um, so I, have, I haven't looked too much uh, too deep into this, uh, to be honest, um, but um, it definitely has a valid point. So now the question is, you know, um, the, 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 the problem in blockchain is not always just the scalability. The problem is the ecosystem and how can you uh, get everyone to move into one direction. Um, um, and so, um, therefore, you know, um, just implementing, a, uh, just developing a good technology is, is, is not the solution. The solution is to bring everyone at the same table and to create a consensus with people which are, uh, which are involved in this industry. So, um, I'm sorry that I probably can't give a more satisfying answer to this question, but it's, it's actually a very technical question. 
Yeah, and yeah. Um, we love technical questions because technology drives the world together with humans, as we said. So, uh, I think Vanessa, this is a question for you, as it says Microsoft in it. How Microsoft is leveraging AI to improve carbon footprint at the energy companies in the developing world? Um, we need any, any, anything to say about this, Vanessa? Thank you. That's a great question, um, and it's very much one that's that's top of mind for us as we think about you know, climate equity, um, you know, the, the question would be, well, how, how does that person define the developing word? But we're definitely very aware that the developing word, if we think, for example, of APAC uh, at large in sub-Saharan Africa is where energy growth is going to happen in the next, um, in, in the next decade. And so what can we can do to further the acceleration of the energy tr uh, transition is critical. So the first thing we do and the first thing we're, we're working very uh, intensely on is the decarbonization of our supply chain. And as you can imagine, uh, our supply chain uh, as, a, as, a, as a key footprint in APAC countries, uh, particularly in, in um, China, India, uh, and, and a few other APAC countries like China, uh, sorry, Japan, uh, South Korea, which are not developing countries. So I'll just focus on China and India. This is definitely uh, a key focus for us, how can we bring solutions to help decarbonize uh, and green the, the electricity supply of our, uh, of our suppliers, direct and indirect. And we have just so much work to do there, but this is a huge opportunity um, because we consider kind of it almost as a low hanging fruit in terms of decarbonization. And then is what can we do with customers? So similar um, to partnership we've we've created over the last few years with energy companies in um, Europe or the US is how do we engage with customers in these markets and how do we deliver a uh, solution to these customers and we're working uh, with with a number of utilities uh, but also uh, you know customers that are that have global supply chain I mentioned earlier for example Maersk I mean Maersk is definitely a global supply chain and we'll have operation in a number of developing countries. Um, and then the, the last uh, piece, I mentioned this Climate Innovation Fund. Um, climate equity is a core principle of the Climate Innovation Fund. And so we are uh, looking at investments that will be uh, deployed or yield to kind of positive climate impact in the developing countries. Um, but but we're, we're really at, at the beginning of this journey and there's just so much more that we can do to to rebalance the climate equity of our investment, of our activities, uh, of everything we do. So this is Thanks, a Vanessa. great question. Yeah, great question, absolutely. Uh, there is one more question I'll briefly answer myself because we don't have time, we have four more minutes. So please prepare your closing statements and then wrap it up and we'll wrap it up. Um, um, Kevin Meyer is asking, but also others are asking, more broad question, I'll briefly give it a stab to it. What's your take on AI's role in making other industries, potentially unsustainable industries, more competitive in many ways. And um, all I can say here is that um, uh, uh, what we observe, at least in all studies we do, myself and others at Insight and other places, is that, as I mentioned before, we are still at the very beginning of a journey of transforming organizations and economies, of course, at the end of societies, towards what one can call more data-driven organizations, organizations which basically the decisions are much more efficient a little bit like the transition I mentioned before in pharmaceuticals, let's say, from bloodletting and, you know, centuries of kind of random ideas people had about how to cure people to data-driven, evidence-based clinical trials that led to the development of every decision, including, you know, what COVID vaccine to let out there. So we are, we are at the beginning of an amazing historic transformation of the world from bloodletting to clinical trials and vaccines in the context, metaphorically speaking, of business decisions beyond, in, in, in very metaphorically speaking. So we are really at the beginning of this and lots of things to be done. A couple of things left. Briefly, speed, round, Juan, Vanessa, Ed, closing statement. Juan, starting from you. Okay. Just, uh, well, in, in two sentences, right? Uh, I think uh, AI is uh, key in terms of driving the energy transition as we are uh, implementing every day. And all the problems caused by the, you know, the, the needs for from AI um, in terms of environmental impact. Um, they're going to be solved by the research community, as we are seeing today. 
And if AI is not, uh, I mean, if the footprint of AI in terms of emissions is uh, still high, then we have a new wave of technology coming, which is quantum computing. And quantum computing is promising uh, way more efficiency in terms of uh, energy consumption. So very, very uh, thrilling future ahead of us. Okay. Yes, technology will never stop coming. Indeed, we shall continue. Vanessa? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's. I mean, the, the good thing about um, the controversy um, is that it keeps us on our toes. And we we'll always have to think about, you know, the good and the bad of every technology innovation that we're, we're, um, we're kind of uh, birthing or furthering. Um, and I think transparency is going to be key. I mean, there's many other controversies around AI, and uh, one of the solution is transparency. So if we can be, if we can create the tools that are transparent, uh, that that deliver the carbon footprint of AI computing in real time, um, that's what we've tried to do with the Microsoft Sustainability Calculator. This is like a good step in the way. And as as you said, Juan, the the research community hopefully will will make sure that we're all transparent and we're delivering to that promise. Thanks, Vanessa. Transparency is also a key word in the discussion about responsible AI. It's a key word for democracy. It's a key word for the core value of you know what we all believe in in many ways. So why not also in the energy and AI and data space? Ed, closing statement. Yeah. Yeah, I can only agree on that, what uh, Vanessa said and Juan. Uh, transparency is number one. Second is authenticity, authenticity of data. Uh, then joint uh, rules, joint standards. And um, all of that is happening now. You know, the first steps are being done. Um, so um, all we can do, you know, all, all you know, is, is, is to accelerate. And um, I mean, the crypto space is also kind of helping that a lot now, you know, as um, as uh, the world is more and more um, acknowledging what is happening in the crypto space, you know, there is more funding available uh, to really double down um, on, on the goals we have set ourselves uh, four years ago. So um, I'm really, really looking forward to the next three years um, in, um, in accelerating this, uh, this change. Um. Thanks. Thank you, Ed. So let's close with this word. Let's double down. Let's continue the fantastic work. Lots to be done. Thank you very much, Juan, Vanessa, and Ed, and the audience. Again, just to remind you, this is a talk in the series of Energy Talks organized by E.ON, and looking forward to seeing you in a future event from this series. Thank you, and have a good evening, day, or morning, whenever you are. Thank you.